Good evening, and thank you, Elizabeth Solomon, for those words and for speaking on behalf of the Massachusetts people at Ponkapog. Um, good evening, and welcome to all of you. Welcome to Old South Meeting House, this remarkable building which stands on native ground, uh, but which has also served as a vital gathering place for the people of Boston since 1729. Tonight, on this 250th anniversary of the Boston Massacre, we are gathered here, here, where an earlier generation of Bostonians came together to grieve their loss on the very first anniversary of that terrible tragedy. Remembering together as they knew then has an incredible power to make stronger the bonds that connect us. And so I invite all of you to be at peace in this circle of remembrance. Tonight we are family and I welcome you warmly. My name is Nat Shidley and in addition to being an historian and your host for this evening, I am also the president and CEO of Revolutionary Spaces a new cultural organization here in Boston that was formed earlier this year by the merger of the Bostonian Society and the Old South Association. Through community partnerships, contemporary forms of storytelling, important civic conversations like tonight's program, Revolutionary Spaces strives to bring people together to explore the history and continue the work of democracy that is evoked so singularly by the two national treasures we care for, here, Old South Meeting House, and the Old State House, which is located just two blocks away. The voices that filled these precious spaces during the founding era call each of us to continue the work that began here. And the fundamental questions that were voiced then are still very much alive. They are the questions that we grapple with in every neighborhood of this city and in every town across this country. Who speaks for me? How is my voice heard? When we say, we the people, exactly what do we mean? Who gets to stand inside that circle? In all of the work that we do, we strive to provide a new perspective on the past, yes, but still more importantly, we want to use that past to facilitate a new and deeper understanding of the world that we live in today and to generate new ideas and hopefully new tools that can help us to build the more just and more equitable world we hope to live in tomorrow. So tonight, tonight we're here to remember a painful tragedy that took place precisely 250 years ago in the snowy streets outside the old state house just up the street. On the night of March 5th, 1770, a detachment of soldiers in His Majesty's 29th Regiment of Foot fired into a large and angry crowd of civilians. Five men were killed, five men. As you will hear tonight, they were sons and brothers, husbands and fathers. Such a loss cut deep. Boston then was a town of just 15,000 people, and most knew someone who lay bleeding in the snow that night. And because the soldiers had been in Boston long enough to marry and to begin to form families of their own, most people also knew someone who pulled the trigger. Across all these years, the pain of that moment can feel exceedingly remote to us, but at the heart of why we are here tonight was a deeply human experience of loss. Hold tight to that. Tonight we also honor the simple power of remembering. Bostonians were deeply divided in 1770, but in the years after the massacre, they came together in this great hall every March 5th in order to fashion their loss into a powerful sense of shared purpose. The most moving of the memorial dresses that were delivered in those years was given by Joseph Warren in 1775. He spoke here in this hall 
and he spoke to a crowd that was so large, the only way he could enter the room was actually climbing through the window behind that pulpit over there. Once he was up in the pulpit, Warren invited his listeners to grieve, yes, and to remember what he called the scene of horror. But he also challenged them to honor the dead by staying true to the cause of liberty. Our country is in danger, Warren said. On you depend the fortunes of America. Those fortunes hung yet in the balance eight decades later when Boston's black abolitionists revived that tradition of public remembering. As our nation's crisis over slavery came to a head in the 1850s, they insisted on marking the anniversary of the Boston Massacre as Crispus Attucks Day. And they used the memory of Attucks' sacrifice as a way to mobilize support for the cause of anti-slavery. More recently, during the 20th century, Boston's great civil rights leaders, William Monroe Trotter and later Melnia Cass, made Attucks Day observances an important touchstone in this city's ongoing and still unfinished conversation about racial justice. And we're so very fortunate that the historic Boston Equal Rights League and other organizations here in our city continue that work today. And so we gather here tonight as generations of Bostonians have before us to remember with purpose, not to dwell in the past, but to draw our inspiration from it. The real power of tonight's anniversary is in the story that it can tell us about who we are today and where we are headed together. Tonight, Boston and our nation embark on an arc of remembering that is going to culminate six years from now, in July 2026, when we all gather beneath the balcony of the old State House to celebrate the 250th anniversary of American independence. Let us pause, though, and be thoughtful about what our story is and how we wish to tell it to each other and to the world. It is the story of those who fell that night, the story of the struggling rope maker, of the young immigrant, of the sailor who had liberated himself from the bonds of slavery, and the son of New England's native communities fighting to make a place for himself in a changing world. Their stories came together that night and became our story, out of many, one. Now, we are fortunate tonight to have a very remarkable group of leaders and visionaries to help guide us on this path. But before I introduce them, I do want to take just a moment to express my thanks to the many individuals and organizations who have made tonight's program possible. Uh, the foremost among those is the staff and the board of directors of Revolutionary Spaces. And I'd like to ask actually that the staff and board, if you could just stand for a moment and remain standing, please don't be shy. The staff may be working, so they're already standing. So, so this amazing team, the staff and the board, are doing simultaneously the work of building a new organization literally from the ground up and launching a dynamic set of programs and activities that connect our city's history to the urgent questions of today. Whew, it's a breeze. Um, they, are, they are a brave group, they are a very tireless group, and none of this would have been possible without their dedication and hard work. So um, thank you all, um, you have been amazing. I want to thank um, especially Berkshire Bank, our leading sponsor for tonight's program. Um, uh, our, they have been incredible in their support and we're very glad to be on our journey with them. Um, and I think that we have some members of the leadership team here in the house tonight, so thank you for joining us. I'm also grateful um, 
uh, for many other key partners and, um, and uh, guides who have helped us through this process. And I want especially to call out um, the National Parks of Boston and the National Park Service, who are truly our nation's storytellers um, and are committed to doing um, this work with us over the next six years. Uh, Revolution 250, um, which helps to organize many historical organizations around our state in recognizing these 250th anniversaries. The Friends of Crispus Attucks Association, which is dedicated to telling Attucks' story um, as an inspiration to young people and to our city today, and the historic Boston Equal Rights League. And I would also like to recognize all of those city, state, and federal, and international officials who are in attendance tonight to help us to mark this important occasion, um, including our city councilors and the British consulate and many other officials from the city of Boston and elsewhere. It's my pleasure now to introduce those who are participating as speakers and as readers in this evening's program. So you've already met Elizabeth Solomon of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. The remembrances of the five victims of the massacre that um, you will hear interspersed throughout the program um, are uh, going to be read by Ted Landsmark, professor of public policy and urban affairs and director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis, Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at Northeastern University, by Nancy Taylor, who is the CEO and Senior Minister of Old South Church and also a member of the Board of Revolutionary Spaces, um, by uh, Ronnie Miller, the Executive Director of Rian Immigrant Center, and by Evelyn Reyes, who is here as a member of the Boston Student Advisory Council. So joining that distinguished lineup, we are extremely fortunate to welcome this evening four of our Commonwealth's most respected leaders who have generously agreed to speak from the heart tonight uh, about the connections between our history and our highest ideals as a city and as a nation. So Governor Charlie Baker, is a figure who needs no introduction, but I will introduce him nonetheless. As governor, he has tackled our Commonwealth's greatest challenges and has demonstrated that it is still possible to find solutions by working together. He's built a state government that is as hardworking and creative as the people of Massachusetts. And I know from remarks I've heard him deliver elsewhere that he also deeply appreciates the value of our shared history as a resource for building a better tomorrow. Commissioner William Gross is Boston's first African-American police commissioner. Throughout a career of more than three decades in the police department here in Boston, he has worked to foster close relationships in and with the community, and we are so fortunate to have his leadership at this crucial moment. We are also fortunate that he has an abiding personal interest in history. Tanisha Sullivan is an attorney and president of the NAAC Boston branch, which has thrived under her leadership and is an important voice for justice and civil rights in our city. And as I hope all of you know, uh, the NAACP will be holding its annual national convention in Boston this summer, so President Sullivan will have her hands full, but also has an important role to play in helping our city to see its complex and sometimes freighted history through fresh eyes. So we're looking forward to hearing more about that this summer. And now it is my distinct privilege to introduce the Honorable Martin J. Walsh, mayor of this great city of Boston where our nation's story first took shape and where it is still being written today. Mr. Mayor, we are so pleased to have you here tonight and thank you for your leadership and your outspoken advocacy for our city's most important historic resources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nat. And I just said to him that, um, that he did an amazing job. Um, and I certainly was sitting there uh, listening to you to tell the history of our great city uh, and not wanting to follow you at this microphone. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to first of all just take a moment to thank everyone in this room who cares about our historic spaces and sites. They create so much opportunity for education and jobs and tourism in, in our great city. By preserving them and making them accessible, you keep history 
at the core of their identity. The Old South Church, the Old State House are leading examples of how we talk about the past, live in the present, and build our future. Your name, Revolutionary Spaces, says it all. and something that is really important. A revolutionary history isn't just about the past. It inspires Boston to be a revolution today for medical treatments that heal people, for leading the fight in social justice, and tonight's event perfectly represents that idea. We all grew up, or I grew up, in Boston hearing about the Boston Massacre, but we weren't always told who was there. The crowds that the British soldiers fight, fired into, as Nat mentioned, was diverse, that a lot of people don't understand. It was Crispus addicts, it was African and Native Americans, it was working people, poor people, immigrants. They weren't just an angry crowd, they were coming together as a people who saw what they all had in common. They, at the time, were the people of Boston, the diverse people of Boston, protesting against injustice. Some paid the ultimate sacrifice, but the stand they took that night led us to a new nation based on a new idea of equal rights for all. The struggle to make that idea a reality was far from over. And it's still not complete. It continues today. So we honor those who fell 250 years ago by acknowledging who they really were and continue today the work they started in our diverse city and our diverse country. That's the powerful truth you're sharing tonight. It's the historic strength of our great city. And it's what we must be today, a diverse people standing as one community, fighting for justice, changing the world. And I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Good evening, and let me just start by saying that um, one of the things that I took from both Elizabeth's comments and Nat's comments was something that um, I learned from my parents when I was a kid, which is they used to talk about the fact that there's history and there's mythology, and you shouldn't confuse them. And when you're a kid, you listen to things your parents say, and they stick with you, but you're not really sure what they mean. And when I was uh, in college, I took a history course, and I spent hours and hours in the stacks at the library, and I went and spent time at the BPL, and I dug through tons of material there, and I found this big treasure trove of letters stuck away in an old book. And the letters actually told a really different story about um, one of the families that this particular professor had spent quite a bit of time talking about. And I thought, well, here's my opportunity. I have a chance to write a paper about this family that will be based on new information, at least to me, that I discovered, and that will be kind of cool. So I wrote the paper, and I submitted it. And in my four years of college, I got a call from one professor one time. Um, he called me at my dorm, and he said, where did you get this information from? And I explained that I'd been digging around in the stacks at the library and the BPL, and I just found a bunch of these letters. And he said, I'm not familiar with these letters. And I said, <laughs> I can't help you. And he said, could you bring me these letters? And I said, well, I'm not going to be able to get them out of the library, but I can probably make copies of them. And he said, that'd be great. So I made copies of the letters, and I brought them to him. And uh, 
I got the paper back. I didn't do as well on it as I thought I was going to do. And the note on the bottom, which I don't remember the exact words for, was something like, um, I'm not familiar with this story. And when you're a kid, you just sort of, I was disappointed. I thought I'd done something kind of cool. But as I got older, I started to understand and appreciate what my parents meant when they talked about the difference between history and mythology. Because there I found my own little bit of history in that story, and I've come across many other examples of history that runs a little different than the mythology. Um, as I've just read books and grown up and talked to people and, and sort of experienced life as it came at me. And I think one of the things that's particularly important about a night like this and about an organization like this and about a building like this is the fact that history is not mythology. History is a shared set of experiences, usually good and bad, which Elizabeth did a very nice job of speaking to, that take place and that hopefully are recorded in some way so that those of us who have a chance to learn from those experiences and that history might not make the same mistakes. And I think in some ways, the Boston Massacre, which was told to me as a kid, as history in a very mythological way, I heard the same story that I think a lot of people did growing up in the 1960s probably the 50s and the 40s and the 30s too. I didn't hear about the individuals. I'm actually really looking forward to what our speakers who are gonna to speak to those individuals tonight will have to say. Until I was much older and I did my own research on this. And I think one of the real benefits of these kinds of gatherings, these kinds of organizations is this desire to sort of keep digging and learning and hopefully growing because let's face it most of the time we all know a bit of the story sometimes we know some of the story and once in a while we know the whole story and the whole story is usually a heck of a lot more complicated than the one that seems most familiar and I certainly believe that our history as a nation has good and bad in it and probably always will. But I do believe that organizations like this and events like this over time can help us all get a little smarter about what we didn't know that came before us and hopefully get a little better about trying to play to a higher standard based on what we learn from the whole story, not just the mythology. And I commend you all for being part of pursuing the whole story so that we and those who come after us can be better for it. Thank you very much. Christmas Addicts. Christmas Addicts is passing through town on his way to the Caribbean. A mariner by trade, Christmas lives a life of relative freedom on the high seas. But in Boston, he is both at home and in danger. He's born enslaved, 
and of African and native descent, Crispus liberated himself as a young man by running to sea. Now he is known to many as Michael Johnson, an assumed name that protects him against recapture and a return to bondage in his native Framingham. He also hides his native identity and gives him freedom of movement. People of native descent aren't allowed to walk the streets of Boston unescorted. On the night of March 5th, a conflict breaks out at the Customs House between the townspeople and the British regulars who had been stationed in Boston for almost 18 months. There were frenzied shouts, hundreds of running footsteps, and bells clanging from church steeples. Many run to the docks that night calling for the rope makers, the shipbuilders, the dock workers, and the sailors to come and help. Crispus and dozens of other men from the docks answer the call. Sailors and soldiers mix like oil and water no matter where they are, but for Crispus, the military occupation of his adopted hometown is probably also personal. At the customs house, Crispus forces his way to the front of the crowd. He boldly stares down a row of redcoats with guns. He is so close that Private Edward Montgomery can see the whites of Crispus's eyes when he pulls the trigger. The first shot fired that night leaves Montgomery's musket and tears into Crispus's stomach. Crispus dies on the street, bleeding into the snow, the first martyr of the conflict that will come to be called the American Revolution. When no next of kin appears to claim Attucks's body, Boston does. He lies in state at Faneuil Hall, where a steady stream of grieving Bostonians pay their respects. The town buries him with the other victims of the massacre in the Granary Burying Ground. With the passage of time, the memory of the other massacre victims fades, but not for addicts. The image of him standing boldly at the front lines, putting his own life on the line, inspires future generations and African Americans and Native Americans to fight for our freedom. Samuel Gray. He's the kind of man Boston depends on. The town is practically an island, and not surprisingly, it makes its living from the sea. Dock workers, shipbuilders, sailors, and rope makers are its lifeblood. They are also its most vocal protesters, willing when necessary to go fist to fist with the occupying soldiers to defend the town's liberties. Samuel, he's a rope maker and one of Boston's best bare knuckle fighters. Days before the massacre at one of the South End's largest rope walks, some soldiers mix it, mix it up with a group of local toughs. The soldiers have spent more than a year during their off-duty hours cadging for jobs in a town that doesn't want them there. For their part, the rope workers are finished with the regulars who occupy their town and steal their jobs. It's a volatile mix. No one knows who starts the brawl, but it's no surprise Samuel Gray is there. When the bells ring on the night of March 5 and angry townspeople gather at the customs house, Samuel's among them. 
If there's a fight to protect the people of Boston, he'll be there unafraid to throw a punch. Once the first shot is fired, the night air fills with the shouts of anger and panic. Samuel stands at the front of the crowd. Those hands made tough by a lifetime of brawling are still in his pockets. There's no time to raise them as the musket is pointed between his eyes and the shot fired. It leaves a hole the size of a fist. Samuel dies instantly. Private Matthew Kilroy, with whom Samuel fought at the rope walk just days earlier, Kilroy, with his bayonet, impales Samuel's lifeless body more than a dozen times. Kilroy is later convicted for what he did that night of March 5, but he's released with only a brand on his palm to signify his guilt. For Samuel, there is no tomorrow. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to stand here today before you, our mayor, our governor, and our honored guests and speakers. For me, William G. Gross, a student of history, proud to be here in Boston. Again, it is an honor to speak today. Imagine Boston, March 5th. 1770. What was going on? Boy, was there a charged atmosphere. There were 15,000 colonists, 2,000 British soldiers who were enforcing the ways of the king. And the colonists believed these to be unjust ways. The Stamp Act, the Townsend Act, and just a decade before, the Writs of Assistance. Taxation without representation. But one thing about the people of Boston, they used their voice. They gathered together on that cold and blustery night when it came to a head between the crowd and the British soldiers. And when the shots rang out, six individuals were shot and five died. And the first, Crispus Attucks became the martyr of the American Revolutionary War. Lessons to be learned from history, and since we're in church, my brothers and sisters, lessons from history, teachable moments, learning moments that make our nation what it is today, the best in the world. Yes, we won that war. And trust me, the war was won by all of God's children. As the mayor alluded to earlier, Boston was very diverse and everyone fought hard. So you may be saying, well, what did we learn? We being the Boston Police Department, we being members of the executive branch of the United States that must often serve and protect the people even during times of civil unrest. What we learn from history is this. This nation shall never waver, and it will always have a voice. It has the right to exercise the First Amendment rights. And when we, the executive branch of the United States, we, the police who serve the people, encounter people exercising their First Amendment rights, we must have a balance. We cannot go back to the ways of what happened on March 5th, 1770. We must strive to get better and better, century by century, decade by decade, day by day. As our great nation progressed, we are seeing what has happened during protest in our great nation, and specifically here in Boston. 
again, we must strike a balance that the people have a right to hear their voice and their words ring true, and we, the executive branch, must strike the balance to have those voices heard without violence. But the cold hard facts are, we the people, even the executive branch, are a part of the nation and we deserve the right to be protected as well because we too are Americans. But you learn from history, you learn, and it does pay off because our nation gets better and better. What I love about Boston, this is the hub of the universe. This is where the nation began. And we've had many great individuals come here and lead the nation. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, whose words will ring true about that we're all God's children, all, all God's children. That man led a march in 1965, 23,000 people to the bandstand. Just as we remember Christmas Addicts, the body can be taken, but not the spirit. So again, the lessons learned are when people are exercising their First Amendment rights and we who protect them, we must find a balance so that we have empathy, sympathy, care, and respect for each other. Because after all, one thing is true. We must continue to strive to make sure that we are one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. To James Caldwell, Boston is the hub of the universe a place to search for work, for love, for purpose. He is the second mate aboard the Young Hawk, a brig under the command of Captain Thomas Morton. Ships make families of sailors. And for, excuse me, ships make families of sailors, and James has a home with his fellow workers on the Young Hawk, but he is glad to be back in Boston after the long voyage to Hispaniola. James is courting a young woman in town and hopes to be married soon. Captain Thomas Morton recognizes his promise as a sailor, and James is excited to rise in the ranks. He has a whole life ahead of him. He is still young enough to look beyond the horizon. When James hears the tolling of the bells and sees rivers of people moving through the streets of Boston, he has no idea what he is running toward. He is a strong-minded young man ready to act and willing to rush into peril. He's 17 years old. In his mind, there's no danger he can't best, no spot too tight for him to wriggle his way free. When James arrives outside the townhouse that night, he finds his way toward the front of the crowd. When the first shots ring out, James watches Crispus Attucks fall, and then Samuel Gray. He sees the muzzle of the soldier's weapons aimed toward him, and then he too is bleeding in the snow. James has no family in town, but he is mourned by many, including Captain Morton. He lies in repose at the captain's home until the burial, when he is joined by Crispus Attucks and the other victims. They are buried together in the Granary Burial Ground, their bodies resting side by side, just as they had the cold night of the massacre, when they lay together, bleeding in the snow. Patrick Carr knows that people are the same everywhere, even if the world is a big place. He learned this lesson by moving from Ireland to Boston, both places deeply marked by civil unrest. Patrick hears the sound of bells tolling in the streets of Boston on the night of March 5th, and his first thought is that his neighbors need his help. He joins throngs of people pouring through the streets towards the Customs House, he follows the crowd, 
surrounded by other leather workers like him, other Irish immigrants like him, other people just like him, and heads straight into chaos. Unarmed and in the company of his friend, Charles Connor, he is only trying to cross the street to move from one part of the crowd to another, trying to get a better view, trying to protect himself. And then the soldier's muskets report and a ball tears clean through Patrick's abdomen. Patrick's friends lift him out of the snow, drenched in mud and melted slush and blood and carry him to his master's house. The local physician, Dr. John Jeffries, comes to his bedside and stays for nine days as 30-year-old Patrick Carr's life slowly ebbs away. On March 14th, Patrick pulls Dr. Jeffries to his deathbed. Speaking through the pain, Patrick tells Dr. Jeffries that he doesn't know who shot him but he wants the world to know that he forgives that man. Patrick Carr had seen mobs before in Ireland and had seen the soldiers called to stop those mobs. He can't blame them for their actions. Others are less forgiving. When the soldiers came to trial in October 1770, their attorney is John Adams. Adams is looking for scapegoats, and it's convenient to pin the blame on Irish tags, those troublemaking Irish immigrants. We don't know whether Carr thinks of himself as a Bostonian, but we know he walks with them to the customs house that night, shoulder to shoulder, and later he joins his fellow victims in a grave dug deep in Boston soil. Good evening. I want to thank uh, Nat Shedley and everyone at Revolutionary Spaces for this invitation and also want to acknowledge uh, the Boston Equal Rights League um, for carrying on the legacy of Crispus Attucks. <laughs> Freedom. 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 250 years ago, as we've heard, Bostonians of every stripe had freedom on their mind. Those native to this land who, as we've heard already, were invaded with an, with an attempt to eradicate. Those who were brought to this land, black, African, enslaved people, both groups of individuals, both native and black, fighting alongside white Bostonians, all for the same purpose. The right to exercise self-determination and a belief in freedom. That work continues today. That work is alive here in the city of Boston as we work together to address the challenges that are facing us as a city that is alive across the Commonwealth as we work together to address the challenges that are facing us as a Commonwealth. It's my hope that that will be what we do as a nation. 
freedom. In the words of Ella Baker, who was the field secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you. Samuel Maverick is 17 years old, still a child, when he dies at dawn on March 6th of wounds sustained at the Boston Massacre. Samuel isn't supposed to be outside the townhouse that night. He is just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Samuel is known throughout the town for his skill and promising future as an ivory turner. He works for Mr. Isaac Greenwood as an apprentice, living with the Greenwood family as he becomes versed in the trade. With the world stretched at his feet, Samuel has everything to live for and everything to lose. On March 5th, Samuel and his friends, among them John Greenwood, his master's son and Samuel's best friend, are strolling through the town together, hand in hand, when they hear the bells begin to toll. Samuel lets go of John's hand and makes his way down King Street towards the crowd pressing against the soldiers outside the customs house. Suddenly, there are gunshots, and Samuel has a hole through his back and his belly, the work of an errant musket ball. John Greenwood can only watch as his best friend, his bedfellow and confidant, falls to Ice Slick Street. John and his brother hoist Samuel up and carry him the entire way back to his mother, Mary Maverick, known in town as the Widow Maverick. Having already lost her husband, she spends the night of March 5th, 1770, trying desperately not to lose her son, too. There's nothing to be done. Samuel Maverick dies in his mother's arms as dawn breaks, leaving the Widow Maverick completely alone. There's nothing left but grief for those who knew and loved young Samuel. For John Greenwood, the loss leaves a hole so hard to fill that he imagines the spirit of his friend returning to visit him. Even on the darkest nights, those visits are never caused to fear, for, as he remembers later, I was so fond of him and he of me that I was sure the spirit would not hurt me. Samuel Mavericks was a spirit no one could ever forget. Thank you everyone for being here this evening and thank you to this incredible group of speakers and readers who have taken us on a journey this evening. That journey, <laughs> the journey tonight is just a beginning. We are going to have several years. Um, to continue this journey together. We will explore our founding history as we approach the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, which is a piece of history that runs deeply through this building. As in 2025, we think about Paul Revere's ride and the battles of Lexington and Concord and the start of the Revolutionary War. In 2026, when we think as a city and a nation about 250 years passing since our independence. We're gonna be on a journey together, and so I want to thank you for having it begun it here in this building with us tonight, but I want to implore you to think about what a precious opportunity we have. This history, this founding history, is an incredibly precious resource for all of us. To touch it, 
is to remind ourselves that the story that began in this building and outside the old state house and in towns and villages all across North America during the 1770s and the 1780s is not over. The founding generation gave us a set of questions. Right? What does freedom mean? What is justice for all? Who gets to count when our voices are heard? And every generation of Americans has argued over those questions. We don't agree, and we shouldn't expect to agree. The thing that holds us together is that we have the conversation. And this founding history can remind us that we, too, are founders to the extent that we still grapple with these questions of origin. We, too, are revolutionaries. And so my charge to all of you tonight is to lean in to think about the story that we want to tell each other, that we want to tell the nation about the history that took place here, but that's still happening all around us every day. Think about the story we want to tell. Think about the story you tell. Be curious, ask questions, learn, but most of all, take seriously the charge to be part of that conversation, to hear each other, to share our voices, and to continue that arc of work that runs through this remembering. Revolutionary Spaces will continue this year to frame a series of conversations about this work of remembering. We're going to have plays and a public art installation and community conversations, and we've just opened um, in one of the gall galleries at the Old State House, an exhibition called Reflecting Addicts, which gets at these questions. So consider us a resource as you explore this history, and please remember that we're still making this history every day. So be part of it, come back often, and I hope to see you here soon. Thank you all. Thank you.